Bonsoir. Je suis très heureux, au nom du FIFDH, de vous accueillir ce soir, virtuellement, on fera mieux la prochaine fois, à ce débat co-présenté par le département fédéral des affaires étrangères, euh, la délégation de l'Union européenne auprès des Nations unies, Amnesty International, l'Organisation mondiale contre la torture et The Right Livelihood. Lorsque nous avons imaginé ce programme, c'était en août et en septembre, s'est imposée à nous la situation en Biélorussie. Euh, il fallait en parler, car ce qui se passe là-bas nous concerne. Évidemment, ça concerne avant tout le peuple biélorusse, mais c'est l'Europe, ça nous concerne fondamentalement. Je suis donc très heureux ce soir de, de, de vous présenter ce débat qui sera, euh, qui est pour nous un des événements les plus importants, un événement phare. Et, et on accueille ce soir donc une très importante délégation de biélorusses, de l'opposition biélorusse. En août dernier, le 9 août pour être précis, le peuple biélorusse s'est rendu aux urnes pour décider de son avenir, pour décider de la succession à Alexandre Loukachenko. Le scrutin a été fortement entaché d'irrégularité, de fraude de tout genre, et l'élection, en fait, le résultat, a été confisqué par Alexandre Loukachenko avec plus de 80% des voix. Au pouvoir depuis euh, plus de 25 ans, il a été élu la première fois en 1994, il ne veut pas lâcher son, son pouvoir. Aujourd'hui, euh, depuis cette élection, en fait, et ça dure jusqu'à aujourd'hui, le peuple biélorusse descend dans les rues et réclame une transition pacifique, une transition politique. C'est de cela dont nous allons parler ce soir. J'aimerais quand même juste rappeler une petite chose, avoir une pensée pour une ressortissante suisse, Natalia Hersch, qui, qui a entamé avant hier une grève de la faim. Elle est emprisonnée, elle a été, elle a été arrêtée lors de ces manifestations. Elle a été emprisonnée et là, elle ne reçoit plus de courrier. Donc, elle s'est mise en grève de la faim. Une petite pensée pour elle. Ce débat se déroulera en cinq temps. Tout d'abord, une vidéo, une production de son excellence, l'ambassadeur Simon Geisbuller, chef de la division Paix et droits de l'homme au DFAE. Puis nous avons l'immense honneur, l'immense plaisir d'accueillir Svetlana Tikhanovskaya qui fera une allocution et parlera de l'avenir, comment elle voit l'avenir de, de, de la Biélorussie et, et ses voeux pour une transition douce et euh, sans violence. Svetlana, peut-être devrais-je le préciser, était candidate lors de l'élection du 9 août dernier, candidate à l'élection présidentielle, évidemment, suite aux fraudes. Elle n'a pas été élue. Elle est désormais fraude, elle n'est pas élue. Et puis elle dirige l'opposition de Lituanie, où elle est. La première partie du débat sera la première partie du débat. La première partie du débat sera la première partie du débat. Et la seconde partie sera la première partie du débat. Et la seconde partie sera la première partie du débat. Et la seconde partie sera la première partie du débat. Suivra la dernière partie, ce elle sera consacrée aux questions du public, car ce débat est interactif, donc vous pouvez poser vos questions via les réseaux sociaux. Je voudrais présenter Isabelle Corna, une journaliste pour RTS Radio, qui va conduire les deux parties du débat et les questions de l'audience. So I wish all of you an excellent yes. evening and thank you very much. prendre la place de la politique quand la politique est pour, pour des raisons économiques est bloquée. It's important to be able to write about violence with the same intimacy with which I write about love. 
We created the kind of community that allowed us to give expression to our dignity. Black lives matter. African young people. Actually, I'm not a hero. Madame, Monsieur, chers participants, chers Ladies and gentlemen, participants. Les nouvelles quotidiennes en provenance de la Biélorussie sont profondément troublantes. The news la crise qui a suivi les élections contestées d'août 2020 ne montre aucun signe d'affaiblissement. Les revendications des manifestants continuent à être ignorées. La répression à l'égard de la population civile se renforce et les violations des droits de La criminalisation croissante des journalistes, des médias, des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, tout simplement des citoyennes et citoyens ordinaires qui exercent leurs droits fondamentaux et très préoccupants. La situation en Europe en Russie n'est pas seulement dramatique pour la population du pays, mais elle est également préoccupante pour la sécurité régionale et européenne. Il est clair que ce qui se passe en Biélorussie n'est pas uniquement une affaire intérieure. Autant que montre des conventions en matière de droits de l'homme, la Biélorussie est tenue en vertu du droit international de garantir les droits de l'homme de ses citoyens. Les autres États contractants ont le droit d'exiger le respect de cette obligation. Les autorités suisses et l'opinion publique ne cessent de suivre la situation avec beaucoup de préoccupations. Nous sommes à maintes reprises exhortés. Le gouvernement belarus a respecté ses obligations internationales et nous continuons à le faire dans le cadre de notre dialogue bilatéral, mais aussi au sein des enceintes multilatérales. La Suisse soutient également les organisations de défense des droits de l'homme et l'ambassade à Minsk entretient un échange étroit avec les acteurs sur le terrain. Toutefois, l'aggravation continue de la situation montre également que les déclarations publiques, la pression internationale, ne peuvent avoir qu'un effet limité. Il appartient surtout aux acteurs directement impliqués de montrer des perspectives sur la manière dont la crise actuelle peut être résolue dans l'intérêt de tous. Nous sommes convaincus que seul un véritable dialogue impliquant toutes les forces politiques, y compris l'opposition à l'étranger, pourra contribuer à une solution durable de la crise. Malheureusement, le gouvernement s'appuie principalement sur la répression et n'a jusqu'à présent pas répondu aux efforts de médiation de l'OSCE ou d'autres acteurs attitudes que nous regrettons. Que faire pour sortir la Biélorussie de la face La question est totalement ouverte et je me réjouis d'entendre les intervenants de ce soir Bonsoir à tous et tous. Добрый вечер всем. Светлана Тихановского, вам слово. Спасибо. Меня слышно? Слышно. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I'm also grateful that uh, Belarus is a feature of this festival. Thanks very much to the organizers uh, for the invitation, uh, guests for participation, and uh, to you all for your attention. I'm here to tell you a story, a story of uh, courage, heroism, strength, and truth. It's a story of hundreds of thousands of Belarusians uh, coming out into the streets of their cities, uh, clamoring for uh, a fair election, saying that uh, uh, the election outcome is a lie. It's a story of people who have been, uh, for the past 211 days, peacefully demanding new elections. They want their, their voices to be heard. This is a story of people who is near and dear, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, parents and children, uh, and grannies and granddads. Uh, they want them to come out of freedom because uh, freedom is most, the most important thing of all. This is a story of people who would like to put an end uh, to lawlessness, uh, vilelessness and abuses because that belongs in the past. This is a story of solidarity, uniting our citizens into a nation because the opposition has become a majority. 
is the story of Alexander Tarikovsky, who, arms raised, uh, unarmed, uh, came out uh, to face uh, uh, the uh, security forces. He came out to say no to the violence uh, perpetrated by uniformed people over people who are, are clamoring for their right to vote. The response was uh, two bullets. He was shot dead. His wife uh, was searching for his body for two days, and we still don't know who shot him. That is Belarus of the past, because Belarus of the future will not hide the truth. This is uh, a story of Natalia Lubnevskaya, who spent 38 days in a hospital uh, with uh, a bullet wound in the leg. She was uh, shot because she was a journalist. This is also a story of her colleagues, Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chultsova, who were jailed simply because for doing their job. But Belarus, the Belarus of the future will respect freedom of expression. This is uh, the story of, uh, the, of Nina Baginskaya, 78 years old, who for many years alone uh, came out uh, into the street uh, uh, with a Belarusian flag, uh, white, uh, red, and white. This tiny woman was detained, searched, intimidated, uh, and fined. But nevertheless, uh, she always comes out with her flag. This is also the story of uh, Maria Kolesnikova, and my comrade in arms, who tore the, her passport in order not to be deported. This is the story of all courageous women who will have, uh, who will enjoy equal, equal rights in the Belarus of the future. This is the story of uh, Roman Bondarenko, 31-year-old, who defended his uh, block and his neighbors, beaten up within an inch of his life. He died in hospital. The, the Belarus of the future will respect people prepared to pay the dearest price to defend their own. This is also a story of uh, physician Artem Sorokin and, and journalist uh, Katerina Borisevich who were arrested and sentenced simply because of telling the truth. The Belarus of the future, truth will be the highest value of all. This is also a story of Natalia Hirsch who uh, a fortnight ago uh, declared a hunger strike in jail. She left uh, the quiet Switzerland because uh, she felt she couldn't stay away from events in Belarus. She was sentenced to two and a half years in jail for having ripped a balaclava off uh, a person in a black uniform. Belarus of the future will not fear love in one's home. This is also the story of my husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, who sought to build uh, a livable country in Belarus. That was why he was thrown in prison and uh, all of his associates were also arrested. We haven't seen each other for nine months, but even being in prison, he has been supporting uh, myself and all of the Belarusians fighting for change. The Belarus of the future will not fear courage. In prison, Sergei Dikanovsky uh, wrote up uh, a film idea about uh, the events of August 2020 through the eyes of people who were uh, imprisoned in Okristina in Minsk. Okristina uh, is uh, a place of uh, inhuman suffering. It's a place where Belarusians are deprived of their physical freedom, beaten up, tortured, simply because of uh, asking for freedom for themselves, for their people. Okristina uh, bel belongs to the Belarus of the past. It is full of pain and injustices, but it's also our story, and I want the whole world to have a sense of what the Belarusians have to go through in their bid for freedom. Neither the torture, nor the beatings up, nor intimidation have uh, uh, stopped our uh, struggle for the Belarus of the future. We are closer to it every day. We have fought and will continue to fight uh, for, for the release of political prisoners. We have fought and will continue to fight for a fair and uh, uh, honest election. We have uh, fought and will continue to fight for the future of Belarus. Because uh, uh, without us, uh, no one will uh, do so uh, that uh, Christina becomes a museum. I 
I'd like to ask you to support us uh, on this road to freedom. Culture and uh, art will also be free in Belarus because uh, only then Belarus will be genuinely f free. Uh, then the Belarusians will be uh, in a position to welcome you all much more frequently at a film festival such as this one. So I, I look forward to seeing a film about the new independent Belarus in the near future in this very audience, Long Live Belarus. Right, thank you very much. We are beginning a discussion which consists of two parts. First, we will discuss uh, uh, the issue of repressions, uh, violations of human rights, then the political situation and the right played by the international community. I'd like to introduce uh, briefly our guests who will speak in this part. Alex uh, Bilatsky, uh, who is a well-known uh, human rights defender. Uh, and head uh, of the Human Rights uh, uh, Center, Vesna. You are a former political prisoner. You have just uh, come. Uh, you have just arrived from Minsk, and you are also a member of uh, the Belarus Opposition's uh, Coordination Council. Mr. Verok, Secretary General of the International Organization Against Torture. And from London, we have Naomi Bazoom, uh, by Zoom, but I don't see her yet. Uh, then Tatiana Morshevich by Zoom, uh, uh, company coordinator and uh, uh, Amnesty International uh, uh, coordinator. coordinator. Uh, oh, hello, Tatiana, you can see us. And uh, yes, uh, we can see you too. Uh, good evening to you. Well, we'll start with you, Alice Bilecki. Uh, following the August uh, election, we witnessed uh, unprecedented repressions, uh, torture, inhumane treatments. Uh, what is the situation like uh, in the country today? In what form, uh, the, uh, what form uh, do the repressions take today, and how does it affect uh, the life of human rights defenders? Well, the situation is, is still quite uh, dire. I would say that uh, we are now experiencing a peak of repressions over the past six or seven months. Uh, tens of thousands of Belarusians uh, have gone through jails, arrests, Thousands of them have been beaten up. Uh, uh, hundreds have been wounded. Uh, spent time in hospitals. Uh, have been killed. Uh, Belarus has hasn't seen anything like that uh, since Stalin in the past 70 years. So 70 years have elapsed, and now we find ourselves uh, in a fierce uh, dictatorship uh, again. What comes to mind uh, is uh, comparison with Chile in the 1970s, uh, Argentina in the 1980s when also thousands of people were tortured, uh, their rights uh, violated, uh, and that was all being done uh, with the direct consent uh, of uh, the authorities. The authorities are right behind all of these horrors in Belarus. They don't want to listen to human rights defenders, uh, journalists, or political opposition. The authorities have uh, decided uh, to concrete up Belarus, so we find ourselves in this awful situation today. Day. So human rights defenders, uh, as part of Belarus society, are also subject to repressions. Today, uh, the eighth, uh, uh, tomorrow, is the 8th of March, uh, the International Women's Day. So I'm thinking of uh, our colleagues, uh, Marta Rabkova from the Vesna Center, who has been threatened with 12 years uh, of jail. She has been in jail for the past six years. She was arrested for uh, merely passing on a parcel to political prisoners. Irina Slobina, who was arrested for supporting political prisoners, other friends uh, who are now in prison, which all, go, which all goes uh, to show that uh, the authorities have decided to destroy all public activity and that uh, pressure which has been, uh, is still being brought to bear on Belarus society. Well, you have uh, mentioned uh, your associates who have been in jail for the past uh, several months, uh, but your organization as a whole has also been uh, 
accused. Uh, I understand, sir, that uh, uh, criminal cases have been instigated against uh, several members of the organization. Yes, on the 16th of January, we had uh, several dozen searches uh, in the flats of human rights defenders, so including uh, members of our organizations, uh, our offices. So uh, in my own office, I also had a search. And we are being accused uh, of financing uh, actions uh, that uh, are disturbing public order. Uh, well, whereas in fact, uh, we are helping people to write complaints, uh, we are supporting political prisoners uh, so that uh, people could pay unaffordable fines. So we are found criminals uh, for in fact, charity work, humanistic work, helping people. So the uh, criminal case uh, uh, has been instigated and uh, is going its course. Uh, I'm quite concerned that dozens of uh, human rights defenders from my organization and other organizations of those will find themselves accused uh, under the same article. Um, well, we'll see how things will develop. Well, obviously, uh, the interna international reaction will be very important because at the moment in Belarus itself, within the country, we have uh, no tools to defend our rights. Uh, the courts don't uh, function properly, tax bodies, uh, the army, uh, all of those uh, are in the hands of Lukashenko. So, uh, supporting themselves on this big stick. Uh, they are waging a war against uh, the whole nation and ourselves in particular. The abuses, uh, uh, whereas when it comes to abuses by uh, law and order bodies, not a single criminal case has been instigated against them. So complaints have been uh, uh, complaints uh, uh, have been organized and logical uh, in a certain sense. And we're talking about a uh, crime against humanity. Sometimes we talk about police abuse, but it's much more than that. This is really systematic torture of uh, quite a significant degree. And what we have seen in the cases that we have documented with uh, Fiesna and other organizations on the ground are clear. So there are three points. So those carrying out the torture have not been charged, and they are actually honored for what they are doing. Doing. So the first message is very strong, and then the second point is that if you complain, immediately you, have, uh, you risk being uh, re repressed for participating illegally in a protest, and then you will have an accusation against your lawyer, there is uh, pressure against your family. So there is an entire structure of repression which is continuing and which re-victimizes these victims of torture because torture remains with you for the rest of your life. And then the third point uh, is that there is a kind of uh, Soviet judicial system that there is a, a certain number of games that are being played to ensure that justice does not take place. And that is a quite a classic of Soviet times, but it's also, if you look at international uh, justice, there is no desire to uh, investigate or ensure justice, so the situation remains uh, quite serious. Perhaps the repression has changed in nature, but uh, now we have a lot of uh, uh, threats and intimidation, perhaps a little less torture, but the torture is still there. And yes, in terms of these uh, criminal proceedings, these criminal cases, Gerard said that there is a new form of 
of uh, uh, repression, and we don't have the same protests that were taking place a few months ago. But nevertheless, there are still criminal cases, and there are even sentences that have been issued. So what accusations are there? What kinds of uh, groups of people are being prosecuted? And can this be any person who ends up in this situation? Well, in prison, we have a few hundred people who are political prisoners. And uh, there are over 2,000 cases of these, uh, of these types of prosecutions. And what you can see is that there is an entire group of people. These are those who uh, these are political activists, uh, participants of peaceful protests, uh, student organizations, human rights organizations, bloggers, journalists all stakeholders uh, from a wide variety of, uh, of organizations. And so what can we do to uh, hold the perpetrators of these abuses uh, to account? So, Tatiana, your organization, uh, you have released a report on this. And what are the recommendations contained therein? Are there some international mechanisms in place which can lead to justice. Yes, I fully agree. There was a report that was released on the 27th of January, and uh, this was in solidarity with the peaceful protesters of uh, Belarus and with the people of uh, Belarus who are being uh, prosecuted at the moment of the revolution of people in this case. We, these people need to use all international mechanisms that are available, even if they are being impeded in this. So we're talking about a universal jurisdiction. And uh, Gerard also already mentioned this. And we have to do so in line with the existing legislation. We have to ensure compliance with international law. And uh, states can also use a national domestic law, which uh, allows the national courts to uh, investigate and uh, prosecute these people. And we need to uh, undertake an improved UN mechanism, so the UN Human Rights Council, the uh, other treaty bodies, the special procedures, and if, uh, also there was a, a, a Mos Moscow mechanism that was used. But unfortunately, Belarus is not a party to all of these, and so it's uh, extremely difficult. And now we need to create new independent mechanisms to ensure this uh, judicial prosecution. And we need to work with other human rights organizations and associations. And we uh, had an open letter which calls on the Human Rights Council to create this uh, mechanism. And I will just say very briefly that uh, the mandate of this is to uh, investigate cases of human rights violations and also the possibility to uh, identify the perpetrators and to uh, provide recommendations for access to justice and uh, to uh, bring these people to justice. And another important point is that this mechanism needs to to be uh, complemented by uh, existing regional initiatives. I was just being very brief. And Gerard, so what do you think? What does your organization think about the recommendations from uh, Amnesty? What do you think is uh, the most effective thing to be doing right now? So, of course, we have the Human Rights Council and the uh, special rapporteurs have a certain mandate. What should we be doing in this situation? Well, I think this is a very important point. What we are seeing more and more in terms of the Human Rights Council are measures that are being taken, but there are states that. Uh, that don't uh, provide access to this special rapporteur uh, to uh, actually visit Belarus. But there are two points here. 
très fort envers la société civile belarusienne. We need to ensure that the civil society is still operating and they are carrying out extraordinary work in terms of documenting cases and, uh, and retaining uh, proof. And what my colleague from Amnesty said actually provides an answer because the special rapporteur does not have access, so we need something else. We need another dimension. We have a UN mechanism on... Uh, on, in Syria, for example, which uh, makes the proof available for third-party countries. And I think that we need something similar. And as I said, we're working with uh, Viesna and other organizations, so we have the documentation of this proof, and we need to ensure that it is maintained. The path to justice can sometimes be very long, but it can be uh, worked on. And so if we have this UN mechanism, which looks at this and preserves this proof, then they can make it available for Swiss jurisdiction, for fi uh, Finnish jurisdiction, for example. That is one path, but it cannot replace what is taking place in Belarus and the support that we need for stakeholders in Belarus. And I think that uh, right now the work that needs to be done is to ensure that justice does occur. I have a question concerning the uh, consequences of repressions and uh, what the authorities were doing uh, in the wake of the election itself. That violence on the part of the authorities, did it incite more violence? Or did it uh, uh, nip it in the butt? Uh, say, what uh, could you say with a bit of a distance? Well, the first few days when thousands of people were detained, who were tortured, and when they were released, and almost 8,000 people were arrested, clearly uh, that uh, gave rise to a great deal of indignation. So uh, following that, we had uh, hundreds of thousand people coming out, 200,000 people calling for those uh, uh, who were responsible for those uh, uh, crimes uh, to be brought to answer. And clearly, uh, the election was falsified. So repressions continued in uh, the following months. Uh, they are still underway, but uh, nevertheless, all those who have uh, been taking part in this repression, so well, we'll have to answer for it. Uh, we are now collecting information, we'll try to retain it, and uh, we are hopeful that both uh, the Belarus uh, justice uh, will uh, start working normally one day. Until today, uh, international mechanisms uh, that could be used today uh, in order to investigate uh, torture uh, should be used. Tatiana, your organization has released a number of reports about uh, uh, groups of population who have been suffering from repressions and intimidation. You have mentioned uh, pensions. Uh, uh, and uh, tomorrow, uh, the 8th of March, uh, you will be releasing a report about uh, uh, women activists. Uh, why did you decide uh, to engage in that? Well, uh, these reports are part of our international solidarity campaign. I have already mentioned it, so I'm going to say uh, a bit more. The uh, goal of that campaign is to show the Belarus population that they haven't been forgotten, that uh, the world shudders. Uh, with in what is going on, and so uh, once every few weeks so we publish a briefing uh, concerning several groups of population subject to repressions. We start with the reports on torture, then about uh, 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 torture and uh, persecution of children, of uh, uh, artists, and uh, tomorrow there's going to be another briefing about uh, repressions uh, against women. We also plan similar reports uh, of uh, repressions against uh, pensioners, uh, trade unionists, and athletes. Uh, very briefly about uh, this report on women, uh, we uh, decided to choose them because the participation of women in peaceful protests in Belarus has been very, very wide, and so 
I would presume that there's no need to explain to you what a major role how they have been playing and that they, they have suffered from persecution. But we are quite often report uh, that uh, they have been uh, uh, per persecuted and intimidated in, in uh, their capacity as mothers uh, and uh, wives, uh, um, claiming that they were bad mothers and ba bad wives uh, and not looking after their own. But uh, when it came to uh, uh, children who are ill, it's, uh, for example, the Grodno uh, Children's Hospice, which uh, since last autumn has been uh, in the crosshairs of the authorities. Uh, uh, the uh, manager uh, supported uh, opposition candidates in the last election, following which uh, in the school she was told that uh, there would be investigations about uh, the profile of her family in November she was arrested for a charity action, then she uh, was forced to follow her family out of Belarus. At the moment, uh, the Grozna Gro 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 uh, hospice uh, uh, stopped operation uh, at two of the three sites. Gravely ill children as a result, are unable to receive the treatment they need. So that's uh, uh, part of our report. What was also interesting, we were discussing a, a wide spectrum of people who have uh, been uh, repressed against. Uh, what are the segments of society who, in the past, did not associate themselves with the opposition, but today uh, are probably uh, more conscious of who they are, part of the opposition. I don't know who will address this question, but uh, it's probably also one of the factors uh, affecting uh, how people see uh, the protests and uh, political participation. So, uh, Alias uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, a few words, uh, very briefly, 90% of uh, protest participants are completely fresh people who never took an active part in political life in the past because uh, uh, political activity was banned, in fact, but uh, they have overcome their fears. Uh, during the election, they joined in. Many of them suffered and uh, continue to suffer. Uh, their health, uh, their liberties affected. But uh, uh, we are talking whole social groups, for, is, uh, for instance, doctors, how active they are, to what extent uh, there are impressions against them. Uh, university lecturers, university teachers who uh, used to be silent, university students who uh, didn't used to be uh, active either. It also applies to workers where strike committees are established. Uh, uh, there are also repressions against them uh, from the authorities. So hundreds of thousands of people sense uh, unfairness, and they will never agree to it. Uh, that is also quite clear today. And uh, I think that uh, it probably pushes uh, uh, the powers that be uh, to uh, strengthen their repressions in order to hang on to power. Uh, but that uh, cannot uh, continue indefinitely. I'm quite sure that uh, given international support, given peaceful pressure from uh, Belarus society, uh, we are undoubtedly uh, going to see positive changes. We'd also like to discuss, uh, uh, we are going to discuss it further. Uh, Natasha, you, were, you, you mentioned solidarity, global solidarity, but also solidarity within the country. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, that has become uh, one of the symbols uh, mobilized in social force in Belarus. So could you say a few words, uh, uh, what have you seen since August uh, in terms of solidarity? Even 
when uh, the authorities, I understand, uh, are trying to uh, disrupt that solidarity, right? Yes. Uh, what we have uh, seen uh, uh, clearly that uh, uh, having to face persecution, myself and my uh, colleagues are in a dire situation because we, uh, we have seen so many horrors, but uh, solidarity within the country, within the laws, is really inspiring for all. And uh, the way uh, people who are total strangers uh, uh, support one another, I don't think we've ever seen that uh, in Belarus or anywhere else in our region. Could you give us a few examples uh, as to how they uh, go about that? We, we don't know here well, the, uh, the fines uh, have been paid. Perhaps you say a few words. Yes, uh, these are fines. The Belarus diaspora plays an important role here. For example, uh, when I interviewed uh, a few people for my report of pensioners, uh, people were 40, uh, 85, 89 years old. Uh, they all spoke uh, of uh, how helpful the found uh, uh, after the uh, terrifying experience of uh, detention, after a few hours of uh, being deprived of anything, food, water, or whatever. And uh, uh, as they were released, uh, this actually uh, helped them uh, uh, pay uh, fines, offered them hot tea, uh, as they were being released. I'd like to tell you a little story uh, uh, which uh, we had, uh, which featured in our report uh, on the culture that. Uh, uh, Ilya Kishikin, who uh, was detained and beaten up uh, in the street. Uh, then he was uh, in the hospital for a week, but, uh, or he was an actor, and uh, every night uh, there was uh, a solidarity show. Uh, uh, for his benefit. Yeah. Instead of him, uh, a rocking, uh, an empty rocking chair was pushed uh, center stage, and everybody uh, spoke addressing that uh, rocking chair, whereas uh, in the background, a voice uh, explained that that was being done as an act of solidarity with a colleague. Uh, that is really inspiring, stories like that. Or perhaps we, uh, well, that, that part uh, uh, needs to be brought uh, to a close. But uh, these examples of solidarity, uh, you say they are surprising. But what does it reflect? Uh, maturity, unity on the part of uh, uh, the uh, uh, protest participants? Uh, uh, is that representative of societal change? Well, 10 years ago, when, when, I, when I was in jail, 7, 10 years ago, I received uh, hundreds of thousands of letters uh, from Belarus, uh, Belarusians abroad expressing their moral support, saying, let's, uh, uh, we, uh, we are with you, uh, don't... Uh, and uh, many other letters such as that have been sent to priests, to political prisoners. Uh, perhaps only one in ten letters uh, reached them because uh, this, uh, uh, we have censorship. But at least uh, people who are capable of writing a letter to a political prisoner, they do that. That's uh, an important part of the solidarity movement. Uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, oh, I believe that uh, today, uh, also at the international stage, uh, uh, Belarus uh, is uh, in the center of attention because it's a European country, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, two images come to mind uh, when we talk about Belarus. One, uh, repressions uh, by uh, policemen. Uh, police vans uh, which appear out of nowhere and uh, arrest uh, left and right. Those are repressions. But uh, uh, the ambassador spoke of the uh, political dialogue, political crisis. Uh, for me, it's an image of uh, the hum our human rights crisis, which is right in the center of uh, uh, political crisis, uh, uh, joy, uh, creativity of people who come out to progress are quite remarkable. In Switzerland, in Europe, uh, uh, these images are very important. Uh, Belarus, uh, 
yeah, is not uh, totally uh, closed. Uh, there are certain borders with Poland or Ukraine, uh, well, uh, that are still open. Uh, uh, there's still hope there. De cette vision au début des manifestations, des, des, des manifestants qui voulaient monter sur un petit banc public et qui enlevaient leurs chaussures pour ne pas salir le banc public. Enfin, C'est un détail, mais ça montre aussi la, la civilité de, de ces manifestations. Merci, spasibo vam. Znaczyta, spasibo Gerard Stebrok, spasibo Bajshu et Tatiana za vaše účast. Chorosho večera v Londoni vam. Alice, vy ostaete s nami, Пока к нам придут следующие гости, я буду рассказать коротко, буду рассказывать коротко про темы в этой второй части. Мы поговорим о политической ситуации, о возможностях переговоров с властью, с Лукашенко, о роли России, которая сейчас поддерживает власть в Беларуси, хотя отношения с Лукашенко. And now you, are, you have a writing residency at the uh, uh, Jan Mikalski Foundation. And uh, of course, Alice Mikalski, you're still with us. I think we are more or less all ready. So now we can begin. So, Olga, we can see that the uh, situation is at a stalemate. Uh, Lukashenko is still in power. What do you think should be the strategy for the opposition in the future? Well, I wouldn't say that this is the case. This is really, a, 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 if we compare the events from the past and what's happening now, I would say that it's a real victory. Victory. Of course, there are a lot of uh, repression, a lot of repression, but in, in terms of the readiness of society to uh, desire change and to engage in this battle, this did not exist before. So it's important to note that yes, we can recognize that Lukashenko has not uh, is still in power despite uh, the desire of society. He's still the president of the country, but nevertheless, we see a huge political crisis. Uh, and uh, the candidates that have been a part of this uh, campaign, they are people who are within the system and they are they're trying to break this uh, elite and they haven't broken the system down completely but uh, we can see that the system is not working as it uh, normally did. And yes, there is, a, of course, repression. And this will continue until Lukashenko realizes that he needs to leave power. But uh, he cannot mask himself, he cannot hide himself. He cannot leave the, the country in this situation. And uh, society is not ready to back down. I'm sure. 
sure that uh, not everybody understands why uh, this is happening, but uh, we can see that this is having a serious economic uh, effect on the country, and it, this is just not uh, possible to sustain. So we need to start the, this dialogue. It's clear that people don't want the system that existed before. So what should be the future steps for the opposition? Because what we can see now is that you think that there need to be more protests as the ones that took place after the elections. But are there other means? Are there other methods that can be used? I think we need to be using what we're already using right now. Well, of course, we have uh, human rights organizations and trade unions and independent organizations. We need to form a sustainable civil society, and uh, people need to be uh, fighting for their interests and, uh, of course, to do so uh, legally. It's clear that uh, people will not uh, back down, people want change, but they are looking for different forms to participate in bringing about this change. Uh, they are working within uh, collectives and organizations, and they are working with uh, independent organizations, trade unions, so people are using different uh, means and they are not ready to back down. And so during the period of, uh, well, I think I as a politician, what we are seeing is that we are accumulating uh, our resources. And I think in this context, we can think about the uh, economic pressure of sanctions and how we can have an impact on this system. And at the end of the year, we will be having local elections, and uh, this perhaps will give us another push, impetus, so that people can once again uh, uh, feel something, because uh, Alexander Lukashenko cannot hold on to power without uh, fraud, in fact, or falsification. So the, uh, there is a lot of... Uh, uh, participation from uh, from activists, and this is what has already been mentioned in the previous session. I think in the past, people said that people are very much ready to participate in the uh, election process. So, Sasha, you were in Belarus uh, in August, and uh, you are actively uh, participating in this movement. And I, do you think that international, the international community, can have an impact on Lukashenko or not? I think that, of course, it can have an, an impact. We can see that uh, Alexander Lukashenko can still have an impact on Belarus as well. Well, he can ensure that people end up in prison, that people are killed, but he cannot stop this campaign. The hockey championships were. Well, what we can see is that we are finding ourselves in a situation where a number of people are in. Uh, in prison, and the government is doing everything that they can to hide the, the facts. And uh, there are no prosecutions of, uh, of law enforcement agents. And we can see that uh, there is not, real, not really an innovation taking place in the country. We, those who want the country to uh, develop further are looking at the humanitarian catastrophe that is taking place in, in Belarus. And we cannot continue uh, in this situation. So it's a, it's a very uh, it's a very difficult situation that is that is occurring right now in Minsk. I think that European countries could should be providing real assistance to Belarus. Well, how far should we be going in terms of the support that we? 
would you provide? What type of support would you actually like to see? Do you want to see sanctions introduced? And how, how effective are these sanctions, in, in fact? Should there be more targeted sanctions? Other types of sanctions? We can see that this is not the first time because there, were, there have been sanctions that have been implemented over the past 20 years. How effective are they? Is this something that really works on Lukashenko? I would just like to respond. We understand that if we have universal jurisdiction, well, this is a process that is beginning very slowly. So if we launch this, this universal jurisdiction, of course we need proof for this, we need the prosecution, then I think Europe will see a huge humanitarian catastrophe and they will be forced to, uh, to uh, take action. But you can close your eyes and ignore one or two cases, but when, but you can't for a number of cases. And in terms of sanctions, uh, perhaps uh, some countries can introduce this, uh, Germany, Iceland, for example. But uh, there is, of course, a relationship between uh, freedom in one country and then the, the, also the loss of money, and Europe cannot lose uh, millions and there are there is also an, uh, I cannot say that uh, Swisscom should for example uh, switch off the internet in Geneva or in Zurich or in, uh, in different uh, cities this is not possible in a country like Switzerland because that would lead uh, to uh, protest but, and there is a, a similar protest movement that is taking place in, in Belarus. So if Europe says that we can lose a certain quantity of money for the, uh, for the freedom of a certain country, then I think that this will already be a huge form of assistance to Belarus. And uh, in terms of these sanctions, we said we were really talking about the importance of this. What do you think about this? Well, we have uh, experience of this uh, sanctions. They were introduced after the elections in uh, in 2010, there were a lot of uh, demonstrations then as well, a lot of uh, activists who uh, ended up in prison after these elections. And uh, the issue of sanctions was a lot more dynamic. Back then. Of course, there are economic sanctions, but uh, after a month or so, all of the political prisoners were released from prison. So there is. Uh, we need to uh, look at the political prisoners who are being uh, ignored. We need to look at all of the uh, appeals that are taking place at the uh, UN and uh, Switzerland and the European Union. They are closed the, uh, politically, but uh, the only thing that they really understand is economic pressure. And this, of course, has effects in Belarus. There are uh, hundreds of people who are in, pre in prison at the moment, and the mechanism of repression is uh, working very powerfully. Russia can compensate for this. Well, you can see that uh, when Lukashenko needs more money, he, uh, he addresses Russia. Well, we understand that if there is no economic uh, military assistance from Russia, then the regime of Lukashenko would, would no longer exist. The, the regime of Putin and the regime of uh, Lukashenko uh, support one another. And uh, naturally, this assistance is obviously important for Lukashenko, but it is not limitless. Russia itself is under the pressure and effect of sanctions, and it's the same problems that we see, for example, in terms of what's taking place with Navalny. This, the brutal methods that they use against their opponents in Russia. And I think that uh, international pressure of 
economic sanctions, of course, is very dangerous for Belarus. And I think that this is a real instrument that could lead to uh, a, uh, an end of repression overnight. Well, you are in, in Europe at the moment. Uh, all good. You're living there. Do you think that this is effective? Well, I think that the issue uh, of Russia is quite linked. The, uh, the political crisis in terms of Belarus between Belarus and Russia is one that we have been observing. Lukashenko uh, is not uh, a reliable partner for Russia, and Russia has, has been showing this. But, uh, but I think uh, Putin is worried about uh, losing his ratings. And what is well, uh, Lukashenko needs the, uh, the support of, uh, of Putin. And I think uh, perhaps uh, Putin could say that there should be some form of constitutional reform and Lukashenko would have to agree to this. Of course, this is difficult, it's complicated, but Russia has its own interests. They need uh, Belarus as a, as a territory because it has a because it's its uh, gateway to Europe. So the task right now, не знаю, мифическим нарастить легитимность, да, он хочет ее вернуть себе. We're not uh, talking about uh, legitimacy here. We're not really talking about reform. And we're not really talking about uh, reform. Um, there is also the issue of financial support that uh, Russia could provide. And I think we need to return to the, uh, the relationship with the European Union. So, the, so Russia is the aggressor and the European Union is the diplomat. But I don't uh, think that the, the package of sanctions that was introduced were really significant. Uh, the issues that were raised with this, uh, businesses were excluded from the sanctions that were, were introduced by the European Union. And we can see that sanctions are, are an instrument that uh, can be used, but uh, they need to be significant, they need to be weighty. We are not just talking about, uh, well, perhaps with, with I'm still in Russia, so a crisis in a, in a country in the middle of Europe, which uh, needs to be resolved. Uh, that situation is not to the liking of anybody. It's not a matter of uh, choosing Lukashenko as a president. It's a value issue in human rights. There's impunity in killing people, raping, violating uh, in, with total impunity. So even if uh, don't talk about um, a falsified election, uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, inhumane treatment. Uh, the OSCE, uh, other international organizations, uh, uh, where both the European Union and Russia are members uh, could uh, bring it up to the agenda and uh, be more resolute in the actions. I believe that the European Union has been very slow dragging its feet. They always uh, uh, picture that uh, Russia is uh, something awesome, terrifying. But uh, I, I understand what you're saying, that uh, the European Union uh, needs uh, uh, to jump in. But uh, my next question is uh, concerning Russia. To what extent uh, the Russian authorities would be prepared uh, to put forward a, an interim candidate, an interim president, uh, to run the country for the time being? Because Lukashenko is not uh, the best person in the eyes of Russia. Do you think it's still possible? 
or at the moment her society is clamoring loudly for a new election and a new president. So uh, the question of uh, an interim president before that, we have a constitution uh, for that, uh, and the prime minister would play that function. But at the moment, uh, uh, Lukashenko is trying to prove that he is a legitimate president, uh, which, uh, well, he has his uh, work cut out, doesn't he? So we need to bear in mind how much time we have, because uh, the longer it lasts, uh, the greater the damage to the country. So uh, either you want to leave uh, uh, without losing your face, uh, or we know how dictators usually end up. Uh, you can't really uh, have, uh, you don't have many examples uh, of uh, uh, happy end for dictators. So we need to take care of our country and to reflect uh, on as to how a dialogue with society could be set up in this difficult situation. Of release uh, prisoners, uh, uh, cut down on repressions, uh, and uh, to reflect uh, on how the country is going to manage. Uh, Another question to you concerning, well, uh, since we are trying to uh, find uh, a way out of a dead end, but uh, is there anybody in your team who sees uh, certain merits uh, in uh, Lukashenko's uh, uh, past? Uh, to what extent uh, he is capable of a dialogue? Well, that is a, a really interesting question because uh, well, it has to do with the personality of Alexander Lukashenko. Oh, you would be aware that uh, he agreed uh, to negotiations because he was not pushed to it. Uh, he is trying to do his, his damnest not to take part in negotiations, but in terms of guarantees, uh, uh, to possible guarantees to Lukashenko. That's a question for society. I think we have different positions in our society. So that uh, in order to minimize uh, damage to the country, I think that uh, could be discussed uh, in the course of negotiations because we, are all, we all take interest in the peaceful resolution of the situation. The further we go, the fewer our chances of uh, uh, an overall peaceful outcome. So it's uh, one of the issues that could be discussed in the dialogue. Sasha Filipenko, uh, speaking of opposition, and its leaders. We are aware that most of the leaders uh, are either abroad or in jail. No, there's clearly Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who is a symbol, who has come forward as a symbol, particularly in the wake of the election. But uh, to what extent do you think uh, she still represents uh, many people in the country? Well, I don't know how to put it. Best. But uh, what is your personal opinion? Could a single opposition figure do anything, or the uh, society in Belarus would need to find uh, their own road uh, to protest independently? Well, the, uh, we have uh, a single figure, Alexander Lukashenko, and we are all united in our wish uh, to see him leave as, as soon as possible. We understand that Slavnik Kanovsky won the election, but uh, many Belarusians uh, uh, voted, not for her personally, but uh, for someone who held a promise uh, of change. I would like to see an honest election in Belarus where I uh, personally could uh, 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 vote against all of these uh, candidates, in, including uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who didn't uh, uh, convince me, to be honest, but uh, I would like to have that opportunity because at the moment all of us, uh, people with different views, are united uh, by having our friends in, in prison, uh, having our friends killed and uh, tortured. So you may have different political positions, but uh, what is important uh, today is uh, not to allow the uh, inadmissible. This, uh, the inadmissible keeps happening in our country. People are kidnapped uh, and tortured. And well, you need to bear in mind that what is taking place is not an economic and a political revolution, but a moral and ethical revolu um, revolution. We want to be heard. We want our voices uh, to be heard. 
we are we realize that uh, uh, we are seen as uh, second-rate people or not people at all uh, in the eyes of the authorities. So uh, it's wonderful when uh, there are leaders, but at the moment, um, neither myself nor my friends don't feel a great need in, in leaders because uh, uh, it's perhaps just less important at this stage. Unless uh, we know that it's very important uh, to conduct uh, reliable opinion polls in Belarus. How can we? Are we in a position to estimate what is the share of the population who are still in support of Lukashenko? And uh, perhaps uh, there is a part uh, who supports uh, opposition, and uh, there are also people who are who are unsure. Uh, what is your understanding? Well, uh, Lukashenko himself is a symbol. He represents uh, the Soviet era, the uh, time of uh, Stalin and post-Stalin. Uh, so uh, people who want a firm hand, who are inculcated in, um, in the values of uh, Soviet barracks uh, still support him. But uh, perhaps during the election, we saw for the first time that his electorate was a minority. Then there are not that many. I'm hard put to give you any uh, specific figures, but we could talk, we could discuss about uh, the army, uh, police, uh, law and order enforcement, uh, people who have uh, uh, a stake in this, because uh, a stake in this corrupt uh, regime. So that is his electorate. Plus. The post-Soviet uh, part of our society we inherited from the Soviet and Stalinist totalitarianism, but they are a minority. Uh, a new uh, generation has emerged uh, during the past 26 years of Lukashenko's uh, uh, presidency. We have millions of young people, new people, who want to be... Uh, who, who want to be counted, uh, who speak against uh, death penalty in Belarus, uh, which is practiced in Belarus, uh, and he supports it. Uh, but uh, well, so you're saying that there's um, a certain share of uh, people who are undecided. Yes, the share of the undecided uh, does exist, as, uh, as always, but uh, these people are not uh, in the best uh, economic uh, situation at the moment because of the political crisis in the country. So they are not also uh, fully supporting uh, Lukashenko. Well, 10 years ago, Putin could uh, uh, throw three or four billion to support the regime. Uh, he's not doing that now. So uh, the regime is doomed. Uh, but uh, perhaps not before it has done a lot of damage. Uh, a comparison with Syria comes to mind, where they had a horrifying civil war. Hundreds of thousands died, millions left the country, fled the country. But uh, the cynical support uh, on the part of Russia of uh, the Assad regime permits that regime to stay in power. Well, in our situation, I believe everything is going to happen more positively and uh, rapidly because our protests are purely peaceful. Uh, we don't have armed resistance, uh, which is very important to bear in mind that our protests, uh, our pressure uh, proceeds uh, through a great deal of suffering, but uh, that pressure is inexorable. It would push uh, for peaceful change. Yes, peaceful, I understand, but uh, there's also a group, uh, other groups uh, within this peaceful mov uh, movement who are in favor of a more radical methods uh, of struggle or not, seeing that uh, there's, there's been little progress. Well, yes, uh, th there's always uh, been a demand uh, on uh, a more radical, on more radical opposition. But as you heard from Les, uh, Les um, the fact that uh, our protests have been peaceful have uh, made it possible for us to show that uh, Lukashenko, his capacity as uh, a zerper of power, is prepared to use any means of his disposal. We want our country to live differently. So there you are. Uh, but uh, there's also been quite a number of provocations. I remember back in 2010, one following a provocation 
communication at uh, the house of government, at the government house. Quite a number of people were detained, and uh, uh, Lukashenko claimed that uh, they were trying to storm uh, the government house. Uh, today, uh, he can't play this card. Lukashenko can't play that card because uh, he can't uh, show that uh, our protests are not peaceful. That is going to happen in the future. Coming to power by uh, any price uh, isn't right. We need to uphold our democratic values, and we need uh, uh, to uh, to push on as before, peacefully, legally, whatever is at our disposal. That is our strength. We need to, to be in a position to, to show what kind of a country we are aiming for after Lukashenko leaves. Sasha, I also wanted to ask you about something different, about uh, certain people, artists, writers uh, who fled the country recently. To what extent do you see this uh, drain, brain drain from the country? Because I understand uh, that uh, where the Western borders are closed, uh, is, is it still possible to leave the country? And uh, what consequences they, they may suffer? Because we understand that entrepreneurs and uh, creative people who uh, were responsible for the new face of Minsk, have they left now? And how it is going to be affect the future of the country if, uh, uh, if, if it's such a serious uh, uh, Issue. Well, that uh, certainly shows that the people uh, today in power are not uh, really thinking about the future of the country, so they're throwing people in, in jail. Uh, so you, you mentioned writers and artists. Uh, uh, people from all the layers of society are fleeing the country at the moment, athletes, journalists, writers, uh, whatsoever. Uh, people who are heads of strike committees uh, at factories. Uh, so you can see, uh, for example, a, a huge drain of uh, doctors, uh, physicians, uh, which is dreadful uh, against the backdrop of COVID uh, in a country where uh, health, uh, pu public health uh, has never been uh, perfect. So these uh, doctors are leaving to work uh, in Poland or other countries. Uh, uh, we don't really have uh, these statistics where people often uh, try to leave uh, uh, unofficially, uh, not being registered. But it's a serious issue, so, uh, which doesn't only affect the elite who, uh, who go uh, uh, who leave the country on some kind of creative uh, immigration, but uh, all of us uh, are children of our country who uh, have been forced to leave it. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, it's probably time to read out uh, the que uh, questions I have uh, received uh, by email, which I'm in the process of translating into Russian. Uh, give me a moment. So uh, the first uh, fairly short question uh, from Tamar, who is asking, what are the principal issues of concern to Belarusians? A very broad question, or perhaps very briefly. Well, I think that Belarus is in a difficult situation at the moment. There are social problems, and uh, we're looking at the economy, uh, salaries, health care, everything that's linked to daily life. But I think that the political issues are quite acute. Uh, particularly in the repression and uh, in terms of how the law should work. So people feel that uh, justice is not work, people are protected, not just one category of people. So I think that on the whole, we have a political crisis and people really are feeling this over the past few months. And I think you've already responded to part of it. Andrei says that how much is this crisis uh, an expression of the problems between Russia and the European Union? And if the European Union changes its tone towards Moscow, could this perhaps change the situation? 
and uh, perhaps calm the situation down. But I think you've already responded to this question. Well, it's always a, a game between uh, Russia and the, and the European Union, and I think that this is a, uh, a result of the game that Lukashenko is playing between these two, and I would like to add something. I think that the European Union is sending a very clear signal to Moscow that, uh, <laughs> that uh, the, this is a new situation and that uh, Belarus is not a colony of Russia. And I spoke in Geneva a couple of years ago and uh, a woman in Karuj uh, came up to me and she said that you don't have the right to say that Lukashenko is a uh, dictator because you have uh, shops and restaurants and you're able to walk in the street, able to walk peacefully in the street and you should be grateful for the fact that you have clean streets, which, even though we did have this uh, before uh, Lukashenko. And I think people will need to understand that we are using uh, peaceful methods for to obtain our freedom. And I think that this will be a very important signal. This can be one of the initial uh, steps that can be used for the future. And we saw that at the beginning of this crisis, uh, to compare with what happened in Ukraine, Belarus uh, did not, does not want to choose between uh, the European Union and Russia. And uh, we can see that Russia is supporting the, uh, the regime of Lukashenko, but uh, the people are not doing. So what do you think about this, uh, Alice? Well, I think well, Russia is looking at this situation, it's looking at the elections, and it's not really important whether the elections are, are free or not. The important thing is to control Belarus in terms of the political relations. We can see that, uh, the, uh, that during the Human Rights Council, Russia was acting as an advocate for Belarus, and uh, resolutions were not able to be adopted on uh, Belarus. So I think strategically, they are... Uh, uh, looking at Belarus as their territory that should be controlled. But a democratic freedom is not something that really uh, interests them. And I'm talking about the Kremlin here, but of course this is very important to us. So this is why the situation is so difficult. Uh, we're talking about the, the powers, the authorities, but also the relations between citizens and neighboring countries. So I think we've always seen that there, is the, there are the authorities and then there's the population, and that perhaps there needs to be an important uh, exchange. Well, these 26 years that we've had Lukashenko in power, the uh, state uh, relations to the European Union were quite cool. Cautious. They were saying that this is NATO, this is an enemy, they only want uh, bad things for us. But people don't really believe this because there are millions of Belarusians that have left the, their own country and they see the situation in terms of uh, justice and security in European countries. It's, a, it's another world entirely. And uh, nobody wants to build uh, Belarus in the model of, uh, of Russia um, because they want rule of law. So I think if we uh, are objective and in terms of uh, wanting uh, free and uh, fair elections, then of course Belarus will be a European country. That goes without saying. And in, uh, with regard to uh, relations with Russia, that of course depends on the Russian political elite. Sasha, I think we've already discussed with you this topic with you. How, can, how can Belarus become an example for Russia? Right now, there is a crisis, or well, who knows what, what may happen or, or how to call this. This is perhaps a resolution of, of sorts, a revolution of sorts, but perhaps there can be some exchange with the Russian population so that in the future, Russia 
can be more European than it is now. Well, I have a, a wife, she is a Russian citizen, and when we look at the situation in, uh, in Belarus, we, we, we can do compare the, the situation. What I would say is that there is a big uh, difference between Belarus and Russia. Russia, this is near peri an imperial power, but Belarus is not. So perhaps uh, Belarus can change the situation more quickly. But I think the problem in Belarus is not just to do with uh, Alexander Lukashenko, but a problem with the entire system, because we are not uh, electing authorities at any level of, of society. We are not uh, electing uh, mayors of, of cities or uh, members of, of the parliament. We have not elected uh, these authorities over the past 26 years. So this, of course, has a, a link to the people. And Alexander Lukashenko thinks in some way that uh, future repression or this system can somehow stabilize the situation. But the crisis is only going to worsen. So this will lead to an even uh, greater or even quicker departure for him because there is no balance at the moment. We need to have a democratic system within the, the country, but uh, the situation is changing uh, ever more quickly, and so he needs to understand that these changes are in the interests of everybody, even the civil servants, because everybody has to live in this country, and if we don't uh, find a solution and, and how to do this, then it will be difficult for everybody. Well, I would just say that during these mass uh, protests in Minsk, it was quite popular for people to uh, shout and uh, there is no place for dictatorship from Habarovsk to uh, Brest. And, uh, well, if you are, if you have positive democratic change that occurs in Belarus, of course this would have an impact on Russia. So this military uh, support that uh, is being provided, well, that was provided during the first few days of the protest, there was the Russian guard that was at the Russian guard that was at the border, and uh, this shows that, of course, for the Kremlin, the situation of democratic change in Belarus is is uh, frightening. Well, in fact, uh, Lukashenko has lost his le legitimacy. He is not legitimate. That is a big difference. But Putin is still legitimate. He has not proved yet. Well, the process in Belarus can, of course, have an impact on Russia. But I would still say that it's difficult to compare the two countries. If they have a different process and the situation is taking place slightly differently in, uh, in Russia. Well, Russia is a huge country. It's, of course, uh, its strategy in the international arena. It has different uh, issues that it is looking at. Um, we have some other questions. I think Emily is asking uh, about uh, getting rid of the death penalty. Do you think that, uh, that revoking this uh, will take place uh, under Lukashenko, or do you think we're going to have to wait? Well, all the signals that he sent is that he is in favor of the death penalty. All those changes that are taking place in the in legislation which were planned for, for this year will, uh, may not take place. And uh, I think that after these mass protests, the, the amendments that wanted to uh, democratize our legislation will uh, will disappear. The, the death penalty still exists in our country. 
такая как бы не be a fully fledged member of our community. So to what degree can this be used uh, as, as leverage or given the situation? Um, perhaps this is just, this is uh, pointless to use this argument to, uh, to get rid of the death penalty. Well, Belarus is not a member of the European Union, and the European Union said that if they want to be a member, then you have to get rid of this, but this has not worked. Um, I don't think it's going to happen this year. And Jean-Pierre asks, how do we know that there was a falsification that took place during the elections? <laughs> Well, I think it's not that we don't need to show that there was falsification. We just need to look at the, the situation. There were thousands of people who were voting for alternative candidates and hundreds of thousands that uh, participated in protests and people who were trying to vote for hours but were, were not able to. So it's not really necessary to, to prove all of these facts, but just to look at the, the situation. The whole process has been very closed. Uh, protocols were not uh, followed. So I think in principle that should be enough. The Electoral Commission was has been formed and is controlled by the, the current author authorities. There are no uh, other candidates, there are no, uh, no independent participants of this commission. So they uh, just created the, the figures uh, and plucked them out of their head. Uh, human rights organizations in Belarus have, have conducted uh, independent observations, and we have seen that there have been thousands of cases of uh, violations of uh, electoral processes, and, and uh, the real situation of votes was completely ignored, and that took place in all parts of Belarus. And we have another question from Laurence, who is asking, how can we how much is the opposition? How can we say that the opposition is democratic when they haven't been elected? So the question is linked to the fact that we don't, we don't know, we don't have official figures of the results. We don't have the real figures, so how can we say that the opposition right now is, uh, she has said democratic, but perhaps she means uh, legitimate. Well, in order to find out who won, you need to hold a new election, uh, set up the whole process with an open counting of votes. Uh, in the presence of international observers, because uh, given the situation in Belarus, uh, when everybody is uh, demanding proof, but uh, you can see uh, the, the picture and uh, people are protesting. Uh, well, if people are protesting, clearly there's a crisis. Uh, and uh, I think in order to exit from this crisis, uh, one of uh, the main demands uh, is uh, uh, of a new election. That is uh, a, a question of uh, representative power. Uh, another uh, matter is that uh, following, uh, two, th two or three days uh, following the election, all uh, of uh, uh, the uh, 
of those in cards uh, were destroyed. So clearly, uh, holding a, a new and fair election uh, is uh, forward and center. The first, for, the, well, for the first time in the history of independent Belarus in the past 26 years, uh, it was uh, the, well, for the first time 170 district uh, electoral committees published uh, the uns uh, published uncensored uh, uh, polls, uh, uh, whereby uh, Tikhonovskaya uh, garnered 95 percent of vote. So, what kind of proof uh, do you need uh, when we clearly see that uh, those uh, particular constituencies uh, were representative? It's uh, not right uh, that uh, people should uh, be afraid of responsibility. Well, at uh, the polling station where I voted, so when we want to show uh, uh, the uh, the final count. At uh, during during the vote, I was in Saint Petersburg. Uh, in there was no internet in Minsk, so my friends uh, at nine in the evening called me in Saint Petersburg in order to find out uh, the result of the election. They asked me who won. Well, I said that it looks like uh, Lukashenko has uh, gained uh, 86 percent, and so uh, people started swearing awfully. I mean, people who are unable uh, to learn the result of their own election in their own country, they need to call abroad. abroad. Yes, I was also uh, called uh, during the night. Uh, uh, the information that was supplied uh, from five uh, uh, polling stations. Uh, uh, we have uh, six or seven thousand altogether, so the overall picture remains uh, unclear. Well, we have uh, a few minutes left. Uh, a few words about the Coordination Council in order to bring it home to people. Uh, in what fashion you, know, you operate? We are aware that. Uh, 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 certain members of the Presidium are abroad. It is uh, these uh, leaders uh, 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 who are designing uh, for the steps of the future. Who is doing that? And the Coordination Council was set up in order to overcome the political crisis uh, after the election to set up dialogue. So it uh, incorporated uh, public opinion leaders. Uh, so it uh, has uh, quickly become popular and uh, posed a threat to Lukashenko. Uh, and uh, that's why they, well, because they, they thought that they might uh, deport uh, uh, Tikhonovskaya uh, from the country, and uh, that would be the end of it. But uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, well, you are aware that uh, certain members of the presidium, such as Kolesnikova, are still in jail. Um, myself and uh, Sergei Tlevsky are in Warsaw. But uh, all the decisions uh, in the Coordination Council are taken by a majority. We are Seven people, and most of them are in Belarus. So that is the value of uh, the Coordination Council, because uh, you need, uh, well, the decisions that are being taken need to be rooted uh, in the actual facts on the ground. So we are pressing forward, and uh, one of the most important tasks I see um, well, stepping up our activity in places. Uh, raising awareness of what uh, democracy is, uh, because many people uh, don't know uh, what democracy is. We were not taught it. Under Lukashenko, our opinion hasn't been important. Uh, so now, given the increased level of activities, one of the main goals on the part of uh, the Coordination Council and the opposition as a whole is uh, to raise awareness uh, among our population so that uh, they could further fight uh, 
for their voices to be heard. Uh, because it's not only, only Lukashenko, but uh, also Russia's interests uh, are among uh, many factors that uh, we need to oppose uh, in uh, peacefully and intelligently. Or the final question, which would uh, close our interesting discussion, to Alice, uh, who, how could it be arranged that the Belarus society, once uh, Lukashenko leaves, uh, would be free because uh, bureaucrats would remain in place? Law enforcement uh, members uh, who took part in repressions would be still in place. So how could you proceed uh, to a peaceful life uh, after what has happened? Who would like to address that? Sasha? Well, a play of mine uh, is about uh, to be staged in St. Petersburg about uh, a doctor who in a new Belarus. Well, it is uh, about uh, a court, uh, about uh, consideration in court uh, of, of a case uh, uh, in a hypothetical future uh, where a member of the, uh, a doctor uh, is accused uh, of uh, not helping a member of the security forces who was, who was uh, wounded. Well, at least we are now in a position where we, we don't really have uh, the right uh, conditions for uh, starting a dialogue uh, in, in Belarus because uh, independent media are not there. There's, uh, uh, no in, uh, independent uh, uh, political theater. Well, we need to, to totally change what is happening in the country and uh, try uh, not uh, uh, will also try to uh, not to seek revenge in the future. Uh, we are still unclear as uh, to what has happened to Belarus. Uh, that uh, still needs to be seen. We all uh, are hopeful uh, that uh, there would be a, a change of, of power. We were hoping that uh, last by last October or November there would be a radical change, uh, whereas uh, by now we realize that uh, uh, th that was only a beginning. So in that sense, uh, we are ready, we are prepared to that discussion. We are aware of uh, the uh, uh, all of the challenges of food, uh, but uh, there are no conditions to even start this dialogue. Well, clearly, law enforcement uh, and uh, the national leadership who are uh, responsible uh, for crimes against humanity, for killing people, would need to be brought to answer. And our population is expecting that. So I believe uh, that this criminals would need to be punished uh, according to the, to the full stretch of the law, strength of the law. All of us need to be aware that, uh, that the country is ours. That unity is hard to achieve. But as soon as we see that uh, it's not the democratic opposition which is uh, trying to uh, seeking something, that we are all trying to do something for the benefit of all, uh, for law enforcement people, for uh, entrepreneurs. We want uh, a prosperous country. Uh, we are interested uh, in uh, raising the welfare of all. I've spoken to people from various uh, groups of society uh, when people expect uh, to be hit, they don't want to talk. But uh, we need to start a discussion in conditions uh, where we aren't, we aren't being intimidated by people at balaclavas in the street. We are seeking a, a livable country where everybody would be safe and prosperous, including 
Members of the law enforcement system. We need a country for us, a comfortable country for us all by 2030, I hope sooner than that. And uh, I'd also like to stress that that uh, process uh, is also a uh, function of how soon uh, the authorities would realize that there's no other way out. Even if Lukashenko himself uh, is unaware of that, there are quite a few people around him who realize that. So, so we should be able to open that dialogue for the benefit of all. Thank you very much, Alex Bilatsky, Olga Kolkova, Sasha Filipenko. Thank you to you all uh, who have been present with us uh, uh, tonight. Uh, thank you all who have been with us uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, uh, good evening to you all. Thank you.